Good afternoon to you. Thanks for joining the show. Today I've got a wonderful guest lined up for you. Juan Velade is a, one of the top Spanish pilots. He is a captain at Iberia Airlines flying the Airbus 330. He's also a Red Bull Air Race pilot, flown the Air Race series for many years. He's a national champ. He's competed in the World Championships, part of the Spanish team that's won many medals over the years. And all right, great guy. We're going to have a great conversation. My name's Alex MacPhail, and this is High Performance Teams. Please stay with me. Ask your questions. Juan, good day. How are you doing today? Welcome. Hello, Alex. How are you doing? Oh, good. I'm very jealous. So you said it's very hot there. You are smoking out in your hangar there. I'm freezing here in Pretoria. But uh, great to see you, a happy and smiley face there. Tell me, what's, uh, what's the buzz? What's aviation like? What's the city like? What's happening in your part of the world at the moment? Well, uh, I think the situation is quite similar to almost uh, everywhere else. Uh, aviation uh, has been almost stopped completely for the last three months. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're just uh, waiting to see if uh, from now on, starting on July, we can recover a little bit, uh, both in commercial aviation sport and sports aviation. Okay, there's the odd repatriation flight going for us a little bit, but there's not much, um, you know, light aircraft flying is just about non-existent. Can't wait for that to begin. But before we get into all the details of flying, I want to just rewind the years a little bit, please, Juan. Tell us about uh, the formative years of, of your life as a, as a youth growing up and being exposed. What exposed you to aviation or what got you into it? Was there a particular family member? Where did the buzz of flying start for you? Yeah, well, uh, fortunately for me, my father has been an active pilot for more than 50 years. So since I was very little, I, I just had uh, his example, let's say, you know, I, I saw him in his uniform going out uh, to fly. And he also is a great uh, aviation enthusiast. So he took me um, quite often to air shows and to, to, to check uh, vintage uh, airplanes uh, around Madrid. So it was very clear to me. That I wanted to to fly, I wanted to to become a pilot, and and follow his steps. Oh, so, what you say in his uniform was he an airline pilot? Did he also fly Iberia? Yes, yes, he he was a pilot for Iberia, and he also used to fly in small planes, general aviation. Hmm. And so, yeah, I got very attracted to both uh, both uh, kind of uh, aviation in this aspect. Okay, that's great. Did you, um, there is a case in South African Airways where uh, father and sons have managed to fly together. Did you have that experience? Was there an overlap in your careers that you could get a chance to fly together in the, in the career in the airline? No, not professionally. I think I have flown with him several times, uh, many, many times actually. But uh, when I joined Iberia, he, he already had retired like two years before. So uh, okay. yeah, we didn't have the chance uh, yeah, to fly in, in the same cockpit of a jet. Okay. Oh, well, so, and I read in your, in your profile then, you, you started with a, a bit of gliding, uh, something that I've been very interested in, but never actually got around to getting stuck in. Tell me about the, the gliding phase of your learning to fly and, and how, did, how has that sort of gliding mentality, energy management shaped your, your, think, your thoughts of flying in the future? Well, I think it's um, at least what I experienced myself. Um, gliding is the, the, the best school you can have uh, to become a pilot because, well, I started to fly very young. When I was 15, I started to fly glider. I got my first solo flight when I was 16. And that type of flight, as you said, uh, you have to, to be very smooth, uh, very sensitive with the machine in order to, to manage the energy and to stay uh, airborne for a long time. So I think that gives you a very good sense of uh, the basic uh, controls of aviation and the basic principles of aviation that then you can apply uh, those learnings to any kind of flying, either airlines, aerobatics, air race. So I think I was very lucky um, to be able to, to start flying so young and in this kind of aviation. So I really recommend if you if you never uh, tried gliding, try it because I'm sure you, you will love it. Okay, that's definitely one of those things I'm going to check off. <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm going to put a lot of effort into my career and getting back into small aircraft, getting back into aerobatics and I think why not throw gliding into the mix too. <laughs> But I'm going to come back to the sort of specific techniques and skills learned from gliding and bring it into air race a bit later. But okay, so you, you, you carry on and you, and at what point did you decide that uh, 
uh, you know, you're going to go to the career of uh, airline flying versus you know, just being the, the, the people that just stay in aerobatics because you're exposed to aerobatics, you've been to air shows as a, as a youth. Uh, was the, the allure and the pull from your father's uh, exposure to what you saw at Iberia, was, was it always going to be an airline career for you? Well, I started uh, professionally um, focused on, on airline flying, but I al always had the, 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 the interest of uh, trying uh, and at any time trying aerobatics and to see what was going on uh, in, when you put an airplane upside down. But that came later. Actually, I joined Iberia when I was 22. And once I already had a, a salary, obviously aerobatics is quite expensive. So I already had my my own salary, my economic independence, let's say. <laughs> so I had the, I had the, enough money to to try uh, a course, initial course in aerobatics, and I, and I did. And really, I, I fall in love with that type of flying from the first flight. Uh, it was amazing. Uh, it was like to to discover a completely new universe in aviation, mm -hmm. and you have to like reset and and. I'll just uh, give it a moment. Hang on. All the experience it was like one it, it didn't. It, it wasn't enough, you know, for, for aerobatics. And it was a uh, uh, really. Uh, uh, I fall in love completely with that type of flying. Uh, I suppose, yeah. That's. Um, I didn't realize. Okay, so you were already an airline pilot, and then you went and got yourself trained up in aerobatic flying. That, that the order. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That was that was the thing. So, so um, yeah, I, actually, uh, if you ask me uh, if I if I had any influence uh, about my father to get uh, involved into aerobatics, um, actually, it was the other way around. He didn't like it very much uh, as a pilot. He in the beginning he saw it kind of risky. He said, "Okay, if you wanted to get some experience in aerobatics, I think I think it's very good to have some experience as." Uh, you know, to, to have a more complete formation as a pilot. Mm -hmm. But when I started to train and, and to compete and, and so, he didn't like it that much. It took me quite a, a few years to uh, for my family to, to accept it and, and, and to even enjoy it. You know? Yeah, and it's certainly, it is a high-risk endeavor, but, you know, with the high-risk comes, you know, a stringent level of safety and preparation, and uh, we'll get to sort of preparation and, and precision flying in a moment. But at what point with this aerobatics did you realize that this is a bug that's biting hard and it's not going to let go? Was it right in the beginning or did you start feeling the, the sense of uh, competence improving, you know, getting a nice sequence of maneuvers? Was it from the beginning you knew that this is going to stick with you a long way? Yeah, it, it was from the beginning. From the beginning, uh, even from the, the first couple of flights, I was convinced, you know, this is what I want to do. Uh, it was uh, amazing, the attraction that I had towards aerobatics, but, but I didn't really think that I would become uh, so involved in competition and even now air racing and almost to, to, to become a, a professional uh, sports pilot. No, I didn't think that but by that time, but I, didn't, I, I was clear to me that I wanted to get involved in, in aerobatics and it was just a, a step by step. It was a, a long way in front of me, but uh, I was just enjoying, enjoying the way uh, from Starting with very basic aerobatics, uh, my first competition in the Spanish nationals, you know, in the, in the basic level. Mm -hmm. And uh, from now, from then on, I started to train with the Spanish aerobatic team. And we had a very, very nice and, and, and very friendly group of uh, pilots that really took me uh, on the way. And, and that, was, that was it. It was just a long way. It's been almost 20 years now. At the, at, at the first time, I didn't think that I would become a professional aerobatic pilot, of course. <laughs> yeah, well, it's one of those dreams that you can have, you know, and you see this opportunity. So let's fast forward then to, to the point where uh, the air racing is becoming a, a possibility. Um, after a couple of years, they, they developed the, the feeder series for the Red Bull air races. How do you go about applying or, or getting noticed enough to say, choose me, I, I want to be involved in this? Tell me about that process where you were mentioned in the same group and then given the opportunity to to try out to fly off to have an interview to get the, get into the Red Bull Air Race series well um oh, i think the correct 
Oh, I think we've, uh, I tell you what, the connection seems to have paused. Are you back? Okay, we lost you a okay. minute there. So we, we got, got the question, question right? Yeah, we got the question. Oh, got okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I, yeah, I have some, I had uh, a lot of contact with a former air race pilot, uh, Alex McLean, the, the only Spanish pilot that, that competed in the Red Bull air race in the, in the first period. And um, I saw the air race uh, live a couple of times, and uh, it really was an amazing uh, sport. And so when I heard the, the air race was coming back in 2014, uh, I just applied. I, I, I moved uh, um, a contact to, to see who, who could I contact in, in the air race, and I said I, I sent my my resume, my my sport. Uh, uh, Curriculum vitae, yeah. and very, very surprisingly for me, I got invited to a training camp, to a qualification camp. You know, just, just the the, the fact that I was going invited uh, to to do a test and to be flying with uh, Red Bull for a week, it was amazing. I was just jumping uh, of happiness <laughs> at home. Uh, so yeah, they called me, and uh, I, I was in this training and qualification camp. That was in June uh, 2013, I, I believe. And after that, I got selected. So that was amazing as well. I got selected for the Challenger Cup that was starting by, by then with some other uh, very good uh, colleagues, uh, very good pilots. And that, that was the beginning of it. So, so tell me about that week where you do that training selection. I don't want to spend too much time, but I do want to get a sense of what is that week of training like where you now, I mean, you're... You're under the microscope, as it were. You're being shown new things, but you're also trying to impress. You're also trying to get on with people. In terms of flying and uh, taking in the sort of you know mental stimulation of this whole week, how how was that week? Well, uh, it was a very interesting week because, as you said, um, we were a little bit under pressure because we knew that everybody was watching us. Everything that we do, that we did, uh, our flying technique, our professionalism. Also, we had to expose some technical uh, like conferences in front of uh, some audience, and um, they, they were just uh, supervising us, you know. And, and but also the, the flying, the the flying was really really different and and really interesting for us because we all came from the aerobatics, aerobatic competition, mm -hmm. but air racing at low level, high Gs is uh, something very different, and we were not used to it. So we had to adapt our flying technique to this uh, new type of uh, sport and it was uh, it was a very very interesting week as, as i said in, in uh, every sense uh, every everybody was the, the level of the race was very high and it was also very very nice to to see that you were surrounded by the best in the sport Okay, uh, we we lost you a little bit there, but I think I got the, the gist of the of the message there now. So you you get in, you get selected, and now you're doing the you're ready for your first um, Challenger Cup. Tell me about that. I know you, mm -hmm. you 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 took it on well. You got quite early high qualifications. Tell me about that sort of level of confidence boosting. You know, feeling like you you're getting into the groove of this thing. It's a whole new series. It's a whole new way of flying. Give, talk me through your experiences of uh, of this early days of Challenger Cup and this whole new existence. Yeah, I I think the the most uh, the most surprising thing uh, when I got involved in the regular race was, as I said before, the the level of professionalism in every areas. You know, until then, um, the competition in aerobatics uh, was uh, we were trying to to become. Uh, professionals, uh, but honestly, the, the level of professionalism wasn't the same as the as the regular race. Uh, both in the in, in the, the flying, um, uh, let's say, the, the flying aspect, and also the commercial aspect, the, the media, and you know, you, you have more exposure in all aspects, and also that really get uh, get to affect you. So. One of the main things was to to forget about all of that um, and focus on what you had to do. Uh, was the flying itself. You know? Keep the so it was 
a big learning in the, in the first months as well in the Red Bull race. Okay, I'm going to put a, a video clip just to give uh, the viewers an exposure of the it's no one of the qualifying runs that you shared with me. You in second and place uh, this for will the give us a taste of, of what we're talking about. Number 26, Florida, you're cleared into the track. Smoke on. Actually, this was the... You there? Back again. Yep, you're welcome to share your thoughts as we watch the video clip. Fine. Yeah, yeah, this was the last race, uh, the regular race, uh, last September 2019 in Chiba in Japan. And, well, it was an emotional race, and, and actually we were very happy at that moment because uh, we were first qualifying. Yeah. So it was a nice, nice way to say goodbye to, to the regular race. But was that the time where at that point you weren't sure and then all of a sudden the, the whole event just wound up very quickly? It, you didn't go into this event thinking it was the last race. It was, uh, there was going to be another two afterwards, wasn't there? No, no, we already knew. Uh, mm -hmm. Once okay. uh, uh, a little bit, about a month before the, the, the race, we, we knew it was the last one. So, uh, as I said, everybody was kind of emotional, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, Probably was the last time in my life that I was going to be flying in between the pylons. Mm. And oh, struggling with the connection again, yeah. I'll just give him a moment. There we go. You back? Juan? You back there, Juan? I knew. That was <laughs> we seem to be having a little bit of gremlins with the connection today. Um, we, well, got, so we got there was an emotional weekend and you we weren't yeah, sure if that was your last time racing in the pylons we'll get back to what's coming in the future shortly but uh, let's just move into race weekend then i want to talk a little bit about your high performance team so you uh, team repsol you also hamilton's a big sponsor of yours or team valade with repsol and hamilton being your major sponsors but uh, give us a sense of what the team is about uh, sort of what are the roles of the people in the team that make your race day possible yeah, well, the team is absolutely everything in, in air racing. You know, we are the, we always say we are the visible faces, the, the pilots. Uh, at the end, uh, once you jump into the airplane, uh, you're alone and you have to perform at your best. But that is a, a long process of uh, teamwork, definitely. So um, we were five people in, in my team that we went to the races. Uh, first, of course, uh, the technician, the mechanic, uh, is not responsible only of uh, getting the airplane ready for the race, but also developing the airplane. Uh, he has to invent, really, and, and, and to, to create uh, new parts. And, and he has to, um, our mechanic, Jesus Cañadilla, uh, is from Spain. Uh, he is, he's one of the best uh, mechanics I've ever met in my life. And uh, he also, he has, we all have to have uh, mentality and a winning mentality. You know, you have to be competitive at uh, every level. Also, uh, oh uh, logistics, uh, organization of the team. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, you mentioned... We had a problem you, with the uh, connection again. Oh, the connection is not doing well today. Uh, okay, you mentioned your, your second person you mentioned is logistics. Yes, the team coordinator. He's, uh, he has to coordinate the whole team and take care of logistics, uh, transportation, hotels, accommodation, airplane tickets. And uh, also, he, he's the responsible for our schedule. You know, he has to, to tell me when I have a meeting, when I have a media action. Uh, when we have to train, so it's quite a, a complex, uh, a complex uh, job. And and the other two members are uh, the technical team. Let's say one engineer and uh, and one what we call tactician. 
they, they analyze all the data after a flight. They download uh, all the data, all the telemetry data from the airplane. And they, they tell me exactly what, what I have done um, in, in the training or in the race. So we analyze uh, the lines, the Gs, the energy, the speed, even my technique of flying. And that's uh, also a very, very interesting job and, and well, absolutely important. Also, they're, they're responsible to, uh, to, for preparing each, each different track. You know, the, the organization of the race, they gave us the, each track about three weeks before the race. So we had to fly it quite many times in the simulator with different type of winds to see uh, or to have a, a very clear idea of what was the, the fastest line. And then I had to uh, memorize it, interiorize it and, and practice in the simulator before coming to the race. You know? So. Um, it was very, very, very interesting job, both uh, in the technical aspect and also in the human aspect. Because uh, at the end, you have five people working under stress mm -hmm. uh, in many ways, in, uh, in, in many times with very limited time to perform. And it's also very important to, to keep calm, to help each other, supervise each other as well. And uh, it's a big learning that the psychological part, the mental part of Okay, you mentioned a couple of things there, Juan. Uh, I would like to just zoom in on just a little bit, please. Are you there, Juan? Okay, so you mentioned a couple of things. One, uh, some of the roles there and the, the type of work that's required of them. Uh, your technician sometimes building new parts. Oh dear. <laughs> well, this is not a very smooth running connection today. Sorry folks, uh, please keep your questions coming. I, I see there's some questions already going there. Please keep your questions coming if we're going to get to some of the technical ones shortly. Um, Juan, you mentioned some of the roles there, like the technician who's cap uh, required to build parts. I've read in some of your other interviews as well. Sometimes they're building the carbon parts overnight. So what would it be, what is the situation that you're amongst the, the, the group of you that you decide, let's build a new part? Uh, how, how have you seen in day one that you need, by day two, you need a different part? What sort of parts are you talking about? And where do they fit on the airplane? Yeah. Well, the thing with the, with the air racing, uh, to develop the airplane, you, we, we all have to be continuously thinking, how can we improve the plane? You know, if you stand still, it means that you're going backwards because the rest of the things are, are uh, overtaking you. So the responsible for, for all the projects was um, our engineer, you know, Miguel Angel de Frutos. And all the ideas we had or, or we collected uh, from we, we also work with two other engineers in in Spain, so we had like brainstorming uh, all the time in order to get the airplane more aerodynamic, uh, to get a better performance of the engine, and to reduce weight. They were the, the three major uh, factors to improve the airplane. So we canalize all the ideas through our engineer, and he developed the project. Uh, also, he he was responsible to see. Uh, you know, benefit versus costs to see if it's worth to, to invest in this or that. And once uh, we decided to do it, uh, we started with the design and, and the, the manufacture of the, the, the pieces. For example, any, any carbon cowlings for any part of the airplane, um, we cover with carbon the Latin gear and, you know, any kind of thing that you could do to reduce drag. Okay. Also, for example, to perform uh, to to improve the, the performance of the of the engine, we developed a water injection system. So we injected water inside the cowling of the engine to reduce the temperature in order to increase the power right the the second before we enter the track. So that was all brainstorming, a lot of analysis, and and then to be able to to develop the idea and to make it work. I like what you mentioned there about the, the water injection. I want to come back to that before we step off the printing carbon parts overnight. What is a part that changes frequently that you find yourself printing over and over or, or making, building 
tweaking. Which, which part of the airplane gets the most adjustments in terms of these fairing bits? Yeah, the, one of the most important parts of the airplane regarding uh, drag and aerodynamics are the, the engine cowlings. Uh, the engine cowling, it gives you a lot of drag, amazing amount of drag. And any, any, anything you can do to reduce drag in, in, in this part of the airplane will be very effective. Also, what we have seen also, um, if, you, if you watch the, the 14 teams, uh, we had a lot of uh, playing and trying with winglets. Uh, the winglets, you know, I don't know if everybody, everybody knows, it's, it's like the end, the, the tips of the, exactly, that picture is perfect. <laughs> the tip uh, um, of the wings uh, that they normally end in like a, a 90 degree angle that is used to, to reduce, so we call the induced drag, the drag uh, caused by the, by the own lift of the wing. Um, you can do as you know hundreds of different designs, and, and you never know which is the best one uh, in order to reduce drag and, and increase lift. And actually, we had two two different windlets in the last years, and we finally stuck and, and, and decided to to keep the ones uh, that you're showing in, the, in this picture. Okay, that looks a lot like the Airbus 350 winglet here uh, on the, the aircraft yeah. that I'm flying. And it also the competitor that with the blue winglet just nearby it looks fairly similar. Do, do the shapes get copied? I mean, does it end up that there's only one or two different designs throughout the whole fleet of aircraft? Or do they all look very different? Well, actually, talking about the winglets, they were quite different. Um, some of us, we had kind of similar shapes, but they're not exactly the same. But as you as you mentioned, if we if uh, we copied each other, um, of course, you know, in, in racing, we're always constantly uh, watching other teams. Uh, we're looking at what they're doing in the airplane. Also, of course, only the things that you can see, you know, the external mm. external modification. Anything internal regarding uh, technology or uh, or even engine performance is more difficult to see. But uh, Everybody, <laughs> we're looking to, to each other, of course. Yeah, sure. Okay, now uh, this is just a picture of you sitting in there getting ready to go now. But you mentioned now um, also having the, uh, the water injection and uh, using that to have the, the coolest, therefore the most power just as you start. Is that something that, that will run throughout the race or is that something that's controlled just before the start gate you have to switch it off? It was uh, controlled by the pilot and... Um, well, the dynamic race, normally we took off, we had to go to a, what we call a holding area. You know, we were waiting for the race director to give us a call in order to clear us into the track. Um, so we were several minutes flying, just waiting in order to, to get uh, to that competition that was about one minute, one minute long. It was a, a race flight. So what we do, what we did during that flight, we tried to to keep the engine as cool as possible. So right before entering the track, when they gave us about one minute to go, we injected the water in order to reduce the the temperature and to be able to apply full power and and to keep the the temperatures within limits just for that minute. Oh, because it was. As you can imagine, it was very, very tight, you know, uh, full power with the proper amount of fuel in the mixture. And so um, if you, you if you were uh, using the, the, the engine at this rating for about two minutes, your temperatures would be over min uh, over over limits. Okay. So it was very, very tight operation. Yeah. And, I, and I presume as well, you don't want to carry around this extra weight, extra water and the whole system. So you probably time the amount of water used for that cooling just to the right amount as well. And is this something that exactly. everybody did, or is this something that you guys created for your team? No, uh, most of the people, most of the teams uh, did it in the last two years. Okay. So we created a, our own system, but uh, you know, the news uh, rapidly developed uh, in the in different teams, and, and at the end of the of the last season, I think out of fourteen teams, probably ten were we were using the water injector. Okay. The other thing you mentioned earlier was part of your team was the, the, the uh, tactician. Uh, I think it was Anselmo you've mentioned in another interview. I'm not sure if it's the same gentleman, Anselmo. Um, yes. So you, you're given the routes beforehand. Or you, you're given the, the track beforehand, and you have to create the route or, or vice versa. You, you're given the, the, 
the gates that you will be flying through. So are you allowed to create any best way possible through these gates? And, and, and some teams have a different run or does it end up that all teams do the same run? It depends on, on the tracks. So we, we had quite a lot of freedom to, to decide which line we wanted to take. In some, in some races, we had limitations for the crowd lines. Uh, of course, that, that was uh, very logic. You, 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 we cannot get too close to, to the audience. And so besides that, besides those limitations, we could fly anything, any line uh, within the, the track limits. And uh, you could see the, the evolution of the lines throughout the weekend. So we started training on Friday. We had some more training on Saturday, qualification and race. And on Friday, you could see many different lines. Okay. Uh, all the teams, yeah, we, we were trying different things because the simulator is not 100% real, of course. The, the conditions are estimated. So we, we, were, we arrived to the races with more or less three different plans. So in the first training, we have to check different lines, especially in what we call the vertical turning maneuver, uh, where, where you have to turn around the airplane as fast as you can. And throughout the weekend, the lines uh, of all the teams were getting uh, closer and closer. But still, in some, some type of tracks, uh, during the race, you would still see one airplane going to the right and the other one going to the left. You know? mm. so, that, that was uh, that was nice. See, depending on the track design, it would uh, it would be a bit more uh, sports um, competitiveness, let's mm -hmm. say. And it, it, it was nice uh, that the, the tracks that we were going that every pilot was not going in the same following the same line, but there were different lines to choose. Yeah, trying to to get any advantage possible. Well, this is a good point to just discuss then the, the, the principles of incremental gains. And I mean, as you guys, in terms of high speed racing, you're on the forefront of that, building new parts overnight, trying to make it better. But in, in achieving incremental gains, you go through the process of uh, the three step uh, process of thorough preparation, execution with precision, and then review. So I, I imagine that you get the track three weeks in advance. There's a lot of team talks, but then your tactician sits down and works hard and you, you work through the simulator. The execution with precision, obviously getting the airplane ready is a big part of it, but then when you're in the air, it's up to you. There's no, there's no pointing fingers, but then the review f uh, phase, you come back together as a, as a team and, and, uh, and, and look at what happened and analyze the data. But can you just talk me through the, the preparation phase? Like, Where is your simulator? How do you build your planned routes into the simulator, uh, your interplay with the tactician and you, etc.? If you can just talk about the preparation phase and, and what a week before the event looks like for Team Volat. Yeah, the preparation uh, is about two weeks before each race. So separately, um, both uh, the, the tactician and myself, we started to, to fly the simulator. The simulator is very basic. They don't expect uh, a very big hardware. And so no, it's just a, a computer program. And based uh, in the, the performance on the plane and with the coordinates of the track. And uh, what, what was interesting about the simulator as, is that we, can, we, we were able to see the data very similar way uh, as the, the real flight okay. regarding the speed, the Gs, the wind, and so. So we could play with that. We, had, we could change the wind from the left, from the right. Uh, we could change the, the energy of the airplane, depending on the, the ground speed. And so once we had a, a, a clear idea, both the tactician and Selmo and myself, we shared those ideas and we came, we came up with conclusions. So we had, before arriving to the race, we already had a, a game plan for pre-practice one, pre-practice two, pre-practice three. And it's very important to plan ahead. Mm -hmm. um, after the trainings, we were uh, choosing you know, the two or three different options that we had. We had to choose. And once you choose one of the options, just bet for it uh, and, and, and try to fly as clean as possible. And as you said, the execution, uh, of course, for me, was the, the hardest part. Um, <laughs> you have to, to be very, very close. To the, yeah, the precision is uh, so high. You have to fly at 200 knots, uh, 370 kilometers an hour, 
at 20 meters from the ground or from the water. And your head, it's about one meter away from a solid uh, thing that is a, is a pylon. And if you fly the airplane two meters uh, right or two meters left, you could see it on the time. You know, we're, we're going down to a thousand or a hundred of a second. And, and every little mistake, every little detail counts. So I had a big mental preparation as well before the, each flight, especially before quali qualification and, and race day. Okay, and then, okay. So now you, 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 the preparation has been a thorough preparation, and and you, 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 obviously do your best, and you look at the, the tapes as it were. You look at the data. What kind of things are you looking at on the data? What are you actually looking for? Are you trying to find that one meter left, one meter right? Are you seeing where you you started the, the, the event one not too slow? Are you, I mean, are you seeing the rate of onset of G is too hard initially? It must be more gradual acceleration of G. What is the specifics that you look at in the data? Because no doubt you can probably have pages and pages of data, but it's only meaningful if it's translated into information that you can use. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, you start with the uh, with the starting speed. We had a limitation in the in the first gate of 200 knots, so we we aim to to pass through that gate at 199.5 knots. So that was the. <laughs> The, the beginning. Yeah, if you were 201. <laughs> no, really, really. The, the level of precision was sure. uh, that high. If you were uh, two or three knots slow in the entry gate, it was a big mistake. And, and you were going to carry that, that lack of energy throughout the, the, the whole track. Also, what we were looking for continuously was the, the, the angle that we went through the gates. You know, um, mm. depending on, on the, the line that you have to follow, we didn't come to the gates you know, perpendicular to, to both uh, pylons. We could play up to almost 40 degrees okay. um, bend the wind. So that was checked by the telemetry. Also, one major thing was the G management. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a, a limitation of 11 Gs in the, in the last uh, season. So once we pull in the vertical terms, we had to go to 10.7, 10.8, 10.5 Gs. If you were pulling at 9.8, that was uh, probably, that could uh, take you half a second or three tenths of a second. So those were the, the, the main factors. Okay. Yeah. Also, the line, the line itself that you have to, to draw, um, we, we compared the lines that, uh, that we did in the simulator with the real lines that we were uh, doing in the flight. So the tactician actually could tell me that uh, I was opening this turn um, 10 meters and I should close a little bit more, I should pull half a G more and all, all those details. Mm. So we were we were able to analyze each each sector of the flight at a at a very very high high level. Also, the altitude uh, in some flights, uh, well, we had just a five meter margin uh, to go through the gates. But in some in some gates we wanted to be low. In some other gates we wanted to be high. Uh, that was the energy management. So we were looking closely at that as well. So it really is, a, you know, it's three-dimensional. It's a, every angle and, and G and knot you can control. You, you try and control it all. It, it sounds, I mean, I can, I can, when you, when you mentioned the, the speed coming through the gate, I think back to my time flying maritime patrol in the Air Force. The navigators used to give us the instruction, uh, you know, we would go and try and find a, a vessel that's stuck at sea. But they knew not to bother trying to give us one degree heading change. So instead, they would say, pilot navigator, make your heading two degrees right. And then they'd wait a few seconds and they'd say, pilot navigator, make your heading three degrees left. So they achieved the same thing, but they wouldn't ask us to turn one degree in our heading. <laughs> but it sounds like very specific uh, and lots of detail. I want to play a little clip here uh, just to, to bring into another part of this uh, conversation. And uh, this is a, an experience that you had with uh, MotoGP Mark Marquez. Buenos días, Juan. Mar, ¿cómo estamos? Sí. Yeah, that, that's uh, well, obviously we're talking in Spanish, but that was uh, a very good experience that uh, uh, we had last year. Um, you know, Mar Marquez, I think is one of, uh, well, not one of the best for me, 
probably the best uh, to be writer that uh, we have ever had. And it's always uh, rewarding and also very, always very nice experience to to share and to know uh, these kind of people. You know? And we had a, we did a slide together, and it's very interesting because uh, right there in that, that that moment of the video, what we were talking about and comparing, you know, all the sports, what, what he's uh, able to do, or the way he's competing in a motorcycle at almost 350 kilometers an hour, mm. and the way we fly an airplane. And there are a lot of similarities, I can tell you that, um, in the way we, we focus uh, before competition, and uh, the lines, and uh, the way we have to react, and it, it, was, uh, it was fun. He's yeah. a very nice guy. It well. looks, like, so, looks like lots of fun. And obviously, you've got that, that common uh, Repsol sponsorship, and that's obviously how the thing came together. A great marketing day for the company, too. But great fun for both of you. I'm sure it must have been an amazing feeling taking this, what is he, six or eight time MotoGP champion flying in, in your discipline. One day, you, he's going to let you loose on one of his bikes around the track. But as you say, this commonality of uh, uh, racing around a track, I was watching him and Rossi racing uh, earlier today, and the the amount of overtaking and maneuvering based on the lines and the angles and that goes down to speeded entry and your exit strategy and you know they don't have g but they've got the, the sort of the leaning factor and the acceleration through the midpoint of the corner etc did he understand the concepts of of aviation and the pull and the rolling rate and the, the, was it familiar because he's a racer uh, yes yes uh, well there's some some differences uh, well, he was uh, Asking a lot about the the, the process, you know, the power use mm -hmm. uh, in air racing. But of course, when we enter the track, the power is always at full, full RPM. Mm -hmm. So it was very surprising for him. So uh, he was saying, "So you don't reduce power? Uh, no, no, we don't have to reduce power. You manage that, uh, the the angles uh, or the radius of the turns. You manage it with the G's. So that's different. But what I could see is that." Um, the, the, this type of pilots, they are used to accelerations, they are used to G's, and you know, we were doing kind of uh, hard, difficult uh, aquatic maneuvers, and he could, he could take it with, without a problem, you know, yeah. that aspect. I've flown with some other people that they are not used to accelerations and speed, and they, they don't have to handle that much. Uh, that well, you know, the acceleration, the rotations, you know, probably you have flown with, uh, with some passengers that didn't take it very well. <laughs> yeah, it's something that you, that you yeah, I, I would imagine of all the people you could give a, a thrilling ride and they would handle it the best, a, a, a motorbike racing champion, MotoGP uh, racer would probably be your easiest passenger, you would just understand it the best. When we've talked yeah, exactly. a, a lot about the sort of build up and the specifics of being a, a racer and, and thank you for all that detail. Another point I'd like to, to discuss really is that when you look at someone's career like yourself, you, you're racing in the top flight, there is no better racing in, in airplanes than flying in the, well, the Red Bull Air Race of last year. It's a long career though. It's easy to look at you now in your uniform, your hangar, the airplanes, but there's obviously it takes a long time to build up and there's some setbacks along the way. So I don't know if you want to share that some of the, the, the events along the way where you thought things were coming together and, and it went a bit sideways and it didn't quite work out and, and how you you know, got around those obstacles and learned from it and were able to, to build forward to the, to the success where it is today. Yeah, of, of course. Uh, um, in aviation, uh, career sport-wise, it, it's, it's a long way and it's never a straight line. Uh, since, since the beginning, I think uh, aerobatics, um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to, to, to start, it's difficult to to start competing and to to get sponsor, to get uh, financial support, that's uh, one of the main things. You know, in the beginning, we were just uh, a group of friends uh, sharing a uh, passion, and we knew that we wanted to to fly aerobatics, but we had to to do a lot of sacrifices. Uh, you know, we had to put a lot of money, a lot of effort, uh, but definitely it was worth it. You know, and also. And many times you think you're prepared, and you think you you can you can achieve uh, your goals or to get good results in competition, and then comes the the real life. You go to a world uh, uh, aerobatic championship or to a European. You make a small mistake, and 
you're almost out of the competition, yeah? mm -hmm. and that's uh, that's very difficult to 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 assume and to to overtake as well. You know, and we have to keep focused, uh, and especially to enjoy what we do, uh, what you do. I think that's uh, one of the main things. Uh, you 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 cannot be too much distracted by the problems or the lack of results or you know the complications that a racing team uh, have if you don't enjoy you have to enjoy what you do and if you start uh, not enjoying what you do then you have a problem you have to stop maybe look a little bit around uh, to see what you're not doing right and reset many things and, and start enjoying again that's uh, that's the main thing yeah yeah, that's it. The enjoyment is a, a key part. Now, we started this conversation with, uh, with gliding, so I want to just bring it into here again. So, is there some skills that you learned with energy management and gliding that are particularly applicable to racing now? Is it, do you find you've got an edge over or understanding the race circuit, how you handle the, the, the course? It could be. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of similarities in the way you have to fly the airplane. Uh, in gliding, you have to be very coordinated very smooth in order to 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 get the less drag uh, as less drag as possible uh, in the machine yeah, and air racing is the same you have to fly apparently it's a very well not apparently it's a, it's an aggressive type of flying mm -hmm. we fly at uh, 11 g's and the, the roll rate of an airplane is more than 400 degrees per second but you try you have to try to fly under these conditions in the smoothest way that you could, and if you are, if you fly smooth at 11 G's, then you will keep the energy of the airplane, and the airplane will be faster, and, and you will win the race. So this is, yeah, there are a lot of similarities with a lot of differences as well, but there are some some interesting points in common. <laughs> okay, and just to get to some of the questions coming through there, so one of the earlier questions um, Jordan was asking. Uh, I think it was Jordan. What is the uh, what is the future for the Red Bull Air Race uh, folk? Is there something that's going to come? Sorry, it was Lydia. I said, will the Red Bull Air Race pilots get together and fly again? Have you got any information that you can share with Lydia about uh, air races and going forward? Well, I hope so. Uh, unfortunately, the the Red Bull Air Race, as, as we knew it, uh, is gone. Um, that, that's a pity, but it's, it's the way it is, and. There's a very solid project to develop an, an air race uh, world championship again uh, without the envelope of Red Bull, let's say. You know? And they're working on it. You know, right now we, we all have very difficult times uh, because of the, of the COVID-19, as, as you can imagine. And so probably the project is uh, postponed a little bit. But I know there are a lot of people working very hard to, to bring it up. And I'm optimistic. I hope uh, you, you could be able to see uh, us, the, the regular race pilots, uh, racing again in between pilots, hopefully in 2020. <laughs> That'd be great. Another question coming from Jordan says, uh, how does someone get into Red Bull Air Racing or something similar from a commercial flying background? Well, uh, you have to have a very good, a very high experience in aerobatics. Uh, all the all the pilots that we have uh, competed in the regular race, we came from from aerobatic competition and also air shows, because uh, aerobatics gives you the the necessary skill in order to fly an airplane under the circumstances of the of the regular race. Uh, as we mentioned again, uh, we mentioned before, you know, low level flying, uh, high G, it's it's quite delicate, it's quite unique. So the, the, the large aerobatic experience gives you the, the knowledge, or, or not the knowledge, but the, the skill uh, to, able, to be able to, to fly under these uh, conditions. So yeah, uh, a, lot of, a lot of aerobatics. And then if you're lucky, um, uh, you, you could have, as in my case, the opportunity to, to be able to, to, to join the regular race. Hard work, aerobatics, and uh, and keeping at it. I think those are the main things. You you got to give it a go and just keep going until you get there. Uh, as, as we mentioned with Dario a few weeks ago, just don't let go mm -hmm. until you either you get through or, or you've had your last breath. Um, Juan, uh, final question for you. It's been wonderful chatting and thanks for your insights. 
you are part of a team that is uh, producing on my greatest arena. So what are your top tips in creating a high performance team? Uh, from my experience, uh, to creating the team uh, has been one of the most difficult uh, tasks in air racing. So maybe you didn't expect this, <laughs> but yeah, one, one of the most difficult things is to, to be able to work um, uh, well as a high performance team. So um, I think um, you have to have, uh, of course, a good selection of, of people, not not just uh, in the technical aspects, or uh, but also in the let's say human resources, you know, the, the CRM. Mm -hmm. um, it's very important to respect each other, to to keep uh, let's say the, the the independence of of each person of the team in its own tasks. So you, you have to, as, as a team leader, you have to be able to um, to let others to develop. Their, uh, their tasks, and uh, as I said, mutual respect and mutual supervision as well. And it's very important to have uh, every member of the team pushing in the same in the same direction. Yeah, very clear communication as well. It, it may seem very obvious, but uh, we have had many problems uh, in, the, in the previous years because of lack of clear communication. So everybody has to understand exactly the same. Uh, or, or, or point in the same direction. So, well, yep, that's that's my my experience in the last uh, five six years. Presume in one minute. That's me. Well, thank you very much, Juan. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for your time today as well, and I wish you all the best uh, once the airspace opens up again. You're going to do some loops and stall turns, and uh, on your on your your flights with Iberia too in the Airbus. Uh, thank you for your time and all the best. We will catch up again. Thank you very much, Alex, for the opportunity. It has been a pleasure. And good luck to you as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, folks, it's been a great chat with one another Air, uh, Red Bull Air Race pilot. Great insights from him too. Thank you for joining the show. Thanks for your questions too. Please remember to like and share and subscribe and pass it on to someone who might be interested. Until next time, stay safe.